It is good to be with you again tonight. As usual, if we have anything that we need to be praying about, I hope you will let me know. If you are joining us on the phone, feel free to give me a call or send a text to the church number, which is 608-224-0274. Or if you have email or internet access, get in touch through the church website or send me an email at fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. And I'd love to hear from you. As of now, we're still planning on getting together for worship this coming Lord's Day morning at 9 o'clock and also 10.30. We are giving the emphasis to the 9 o'clock service with the idea of replaying that service in the auditorium on the projector at 10.30 if somebody shows up at that time. But because of the high COVID numbers here in Madison and Dane County, we're in emphasizing that 9 o'clock service uh, since most people are joining us online and very few are joining us actually in person at the building. So if you can join us on Sunday, uh, please be sure to sign up online and also remember we are keeping the doors and the windows open so be sure to bundle up and please also remember to bring your own supplies for the lord's supper if at all possible we're trying to avoid uh, the number of things or lower the number of things that we touch at the building so uh, trying to keep us all safe tonight we are continuing on with our pause in studying the book of luke and we are getting back to our study of a worksheet on the subject of baptism and I've tried to put a link to the worksheet on the description under the YouTube video. It's also on our website under Articles. And that would be under the Grow tab, as in Growing in Our Christian Faith. Those are some resources for us. So under the Grow tab, uh, there's a place to click on Articles. And this one is found under there, under the Baptism Study Guide. I think we've also put it in the comments under the link to tonight's class in the Facebook group. And I also mailed it last week to those of you who join us on the phone. So if you do not have this yet, and if you would like to have a copy, please let me know. And I'd be glad to email it to you or send you the link or uh, mail you a hard copy through the Postal Service. But it'd be very helpful if you could have this in front of you on paper tonight, if at all possible, so that we can fill in some blanks as we work through it. We're studying this because there's quite a bit of confusion on baptism out there in the religious world from infant baptism to the idea that baptism isn't even necessary at all and much of this goes back to the timing of baptism where should baptism land on a timeline of our own spiritual history and so that's a big part of this and because of this confusion we started last week by noting a series of questions and the goal here at the beginning is this. We want people to be sure of what they have done. Often when people come to worship with us for a while, it's very easy to hear what we're saying and then to project that back on their own personal experience. Oh yeah, I think that's what I did uh, after they've heard it the biblical way for a while. But since what we understood at the time we were baptized is so important, we really need to allow people to make sure in their own minds what they have actually done without being influenced by us. And so we have these questions, and as we study, uh, I might help the person I'm studying with work through these things, but I need to be really sure that I'm not leading them or suggesting their answers. If I fill this out, uh, I do it at the same time, but it's important that I don't influence their answers. It's not a matter of me saying, look, this is what I've done. Uh, this is what you did, right? I don't want to do that. I want them to come to their own conclusions, and then I'll share my answers uh, after we go through there. So they go first on this. So this is why we have these questions here at the beginning, not at the end. And again, this is uh, probably not for our benefit tonight. Those of us who are joining in on this class, most likely we have already obeyed the gospel. Uh, it might be helpful to us personally, and that's awesome. Uh, but that's not our goal tonight. Our goal tonight as Christians is to get familiar with this study guide as one of many more resources so that we can go out and we can use it with others. Our mission is to teach and preach the gospel to the world around us. So this is a tool for doing that. So in these six questions, we try to bring some clarity concerning what someone has actually done in terms of baptism. Have they made a commitment to Christ? And if so, at what age? Was there some kind of confession involved? And if so, what was it? Have they been baptized? Describe the action. What was that like? What did it look like? Was it a sprinkling, a pouring, an immersion, and so on? Was there any delay between their commitment to follow Christ and the baptism itself? Uh, was it done immediately? Was it several months? Was it a couple years later? Uh, what was the purpose of their baptism? Why did they do what they did? And then were they saved before or at the moment of baptism? 
And as I mentioned last week, it might actually be helpful to make a timeline of some kind uh, to help this make sense. And once we establish these things, then we might share what we have experienced. So thank them. This is okay. Thank you for sharing what you've done. Is it okay if I share what I went through when I obeyed the gospel? And then we start looking at the scriptures together after that. As the little paragraph explains, the sheet contains every reference to Jesus' baptism in water after the Lord's resurrection. So we're we're not dealing with John's baptism. We're not dealing with Holy Spirit baptism. Uh, not that we're afraid of or avoiding those things. That's just not within the scope of this study. Uh, last week, we made it through the first four references, two accounts of the Great Commission, then Peter's sermon, and the baptism of 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, and the baptism of a number of men and women up in Samaria in Acts chapter 8. Uh, so far then, by combining these things together, we've learned baptism is for those who are old enough to be students or disciples. That's what the word disciple means, a student or a learner, a follower. Uh, they're old enough to feel guilt, as did the people on the day of Pentecost. So we're not talking about little babies there. Uh, they were old enough to believe, old enough to repent of their sins, to have a change of heart. And so a picture is starting to form of an accountable person old enough to uh, feel guilty for sin and believe in the Lord. Uh, we really didn't find too much as to the action of baptism, whether it's sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. But we did learn that belief comes before baptism. And so in the timeline, we're getting a clearer picture here. And, and we also learned that people were baptized the same day that they believed. So there was no 13-year gap or 12-year gap, as with the case of confirmation. But rather, people were baptized almost immediately. We learn that baptism is for the forgiveness of sins in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. We learn that it is essential to salvation and that it's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or by God's authority would be another way of putting this. And this, of course, is a rather quick summary of everything we studied last week. That lesson should still be available online on YouTube and the link through the Facebook group. But let's keep working our way through the study guide tonight. And we start tonight with the next reference to baptism in the book of Acts, the baptism of the Ethiopian officer or the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Acts 8, 26 through 40. I know we have some small print on the screen. That's okay. Uh, all of us should have access to a Bible of our own. We're just putting this up here so we know what we're dealing with. Uh, remember, we left off last week with Philip baptizing a number of men and women up in Samaria. Well, an Ethiopian treasurer was traveling from Jerusalem back home to Ethiopia, and we find that he's reading Isaiah the prophet. And so God takes Philip away from Samaria, where he was very successful in his preaching of the gospel, and God sends Philip to meet this man from Ethiopia in his chariot on the road as he travels. So that brings us to Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Acts 8, 26 through 40. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this, He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation, for his life is removed from the earth? The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. 
When they came up out of the water, the, Philip of, uh, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. All right, back on our chart. There's a lot in this passage, so we're just looking through the questions in the chart here mainly. But as to the man's age, uh, what do you think? How old is he? Remember, we're not giving answers here, but we're uh, encouraging the person that we're studying with to think through it. So how old is this man? Do we have any clues here? Well, he was the treasurer of the nation of Ethiopia. They usually don't give that job to kids. That's what I'm thinking. This is not a job for somebody who's a week old. This is not for a five-year-old. Um, this office, as I understand it, is vacant in the United States right now. That position is not filled. But uh, the most recent treasurer of the United States is Jovita Carranza, and she is 71 years old right now. All right, so if this man from Ethiopia were treasurer here in the U.S. right now, um, he might be a little bit older than most people. His signature would be on all of our paper currency, wouldn't it? Uh, we have the, the treasurer signing, well, not signing all of our money, but that signature is on all of our paper currency. So that is a significant position, isn't it? Uh, this is a position of great responsibility. Uh, but the point is, uh, this guy is old enough to be treasurer. Uh, what about the action? Do we learn anything here concerning whether this was a sprinkling, a pouring, or an immersion? Well, absolutely we do. In verse 38, notice the text says, They both went down into the water. Philip baptizes the man, and then they come up out of the water. And my question is, if sprinkling had been the option here, don't we think that the treasurer of a nation would have been smart enough to have some kind of water with him on the chariot, at least enough to do a sprinkling. I would say yes. Um, this guy traveling through a deserted area, uh, by the way, a desert area does not mean desert desert, but when you look up that word, it just means wilderness, like a deserted area. Um, so he would have had enough water in his chariot to do a sprinkling. If this was a sprinkling that Philip was commanding him to do, uh, they could have done it right there in the chariot. But instead of sprinkling or pouring, they actually have to go down into the water for the man to be baptized. And so the man is immersed. Uh, I would point out it's not necessary for Philip to be immersed. Philip is the one doing the baptizing. Um, but it is the Ethiopian officer who is the one is, who is immersed. Uh, what about the when? When did this take place in this process? This was fast, wasn't it? That's about all I can say. It was fast. This was immediate. Uh, in my mind, we can almost hear the screeching of the chariot wheels. That's the way I look at this. Uh, Philip preaches Jesus, and the officer's immediate, instantaneous reaction, almost interrupting his sermon, is this. Look, water, why can't I be baptized? And I'm just paraphrasing there, but that's, that's the thought. And so, um, after confessing his belief in Jesus as the Son of God, he orders the chariot to stop. And he's baptized immediately right there on the spot. I know when we travel along the highway, even through desert, deserted areas, um, I'm thinking of where they excavate and they have those ponds out beside the interchanges, if you know what I'm talking about there. Uh, we often see bodies of water along the road as we travel. And so he's traveling. Uh, Philip preaches Jesus. Look, there's water. Why can't I be baptized? He orders the chariot to stop. They both go down into the water and he's baptized immediately. So it happens almost instantaneously after hearing and believing the gospel. It's very quick. Uh, I don't see too much concerning the purpose here, not explicitly stated anyway. Uh, we could probably make the argument that the reason everything happens so quickly is because baptism is necessary for salvation. This is not something you want to put off. Yes, I'm lost without baptism. I need to do this. So let's do this two months from now. Uh, that's not a conclusion that he came to here, but rather it was instant. And so, although not explicitly stated, I think we can probably safely assume from the context here that it is incredibly important. But I, we don't need to put anything there since it's not stated directly. Uh, as to other, I would note that preaching Jesus equals preaching baptism. If you remember, Jesus' ministry started with his own baptism. Remember, John the Baptist Jesus came to John to be baptized by him in the Jordan. That's how he started his public ministry. How did Jesus' public ministry end? 
it ended with him telling his disciples to go baptize the whole world. And so his ministry started and ended with baptism, his own baptism, and then his command to go baptize everybody possible. You cannot tell the story of Jesus without saying something, without saying a lot about baptism. To preach Jesus is to preach baptism. You would have to uh, mutilate the story to take baptism out of the story of Jesus. And so I always find it interesting when the officer hears about Jesus, his first reaction is to want to be baptized. Um, and I think we could say the same thing today. If we today are preaching Jesus, people should hear us and their reaction should be, I want to be baptized too. And if that's not the reaction, either we're preaching to some cold-hearted people who don't care or we're, we're missing something and we're leaving something out there. Um, I would also note something about the confession here, and I would note that rejoicing comes after baptism, not before. He didn't hear Jesus rejoice and then get baptized, but the rejoicing came afterwards, and there is a reason for that order. So in summary, uh, the man is old enough to be treasurer of Ethiopia. They come to the water, they go down into the water, they come up out of the water. This is an immersion. It happens immediately. He orders the chariot to stop and they do it. We also learn baptism is the natural reaction of an honest heart to hearing preaching about Jesus. Uh, when we come to, I think it was verse 37, some may have a little footnote there. The New American Standard has it in brackets. Uh, some translations leave it out entirely. Maybe they put the entire verse in a footnote or at the bottom of the page. Uh, just be aware that verse 37 is not found in some of the oldest manuscripts. And uh, we don't need to get into that depth with the people that we're studying with. But just be aware of that. If you want to learn more about that, I'd be glad to send you an article about that. But you might have noticed a little footnote there. And just be prepared to handle that if somebody brings that up uh, as we're studying together. Okay, let us move on. And we now come to the conversion of Saul, whose name was later changed to Paul. And as a young man, he basically holds the coats of those who stoned Stephen in Acts chapter 7. We then have Acts 8, where we've just been, Philip preaching, baptizing in Samaria, then studying with and baptizing the Ethiopian treasurer. And now we pick up here in Acts chapter 9. So let's look at Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings for the, and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you are coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Uh, we do have uh, one other detail that comes later in Acts. Paul is retelling this story 
to an angry mob, and he's telling him his own conversion experience. And in the retelling of the story, he explains exactly what Ananias said. So we have more details over in Acts 22:16. So after Saul had been praying and fasting for three days, we come to Acts 22:16, and Ananias says this to Saul. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So as to the first blank up here, how old is Saul at this point? Well, he's not old in the sense of being elderly, but he is old enough to persecute the church, isn't he? Uh, he's definitely an adult. We don't have anything about the action here as to whether this is sprinkling, pouring, or immersion other than the word itself, but that's not what we're looking at. Uh, as to the when, though, that's where Acts 22.16 comes in. Ananias is definitely concerned that Saul not delay with this. Time is of the essence. Uh, by the way, many years ago, somebody corrected me concerning Ananias. Uh, in passing, I just happened to mention that the preacher Ananias came and talked to Saul, that God sent the preacher Ananias to go talk to Saul. Um, however, a good brother reminded me that Ananias is never described as being a preacher. And I thought, well, surely this guy who's correcting me is wrong. Ananias is obviously a preacher. God got a preacher to go talk to Saul. Uh, but I looked it up, and Ananias is simply described as being a disciple. And that's a good reminder to me. When God needed somebody to go teach one of the most well-educated and one of the most notorious persecutors of the church. He did not go with proven Philip, an evangelist, but rather he sent a certain disciple by the name of Ananias. And I would point out here, all of us are disciples. All of us are Ananiases, if we could put it that way. And that's one reason why we're looking at these tools for teaching, these study guides. All of us can do what this man did. He's not described as being a preacher. He's just a guy. He's just a disciple like all of us. We're getting, we're getting ourselves ready to be used by the Lord just as Ananias was. Uh, also, another note here, uh, God never tells people what to do to be saved directly. I know a lot of times in the denominational world, people will say, well, God whispered to me to do this, or the Spirit moved me uh, to do this, or an angel told me to do that. That's not how that happens. Uh, in the Bible... God arranged for uh, one of his people to go tell the gospel story to individuals. So God never told them directly what to do to be saved, uh, but God arranged the meeting, we might say, providentially. Uh, as to the purpose, Ananias is clear that baptism is to wash away sins. So that's very clear here in Acts twenty two sixteen, Baptism is how we call on the Lord's name. And so, yes, baptism is necessary for salvation in this case. Under other, I would also point out again that Saul was not saved after praying and fasting for three days. Uh, many people today would say, if you pray and fast for three days, you're good to go. Uh, but after those three days of prayer and fasting, Ananias orders Saul to not delay, but to be baptized immediately for the purpose of washing away his sins. Uh, another note here, some people refer to Saul being saved on the road to Damascus, that he was converted on the road to Damascus. That's not really the case, is it? I believe still in town we have, a, there's a church known as the Damascus Road Church. Well, Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, but he was still in sin. He was still lost at that point. He was lost on Damascus Road. He was not saved until three days later, once he got to Damascus and met up with Ananias and was told what to do, and only then of what were his sins washed away. So uh, I would just put the emphasis not on Damascus Road. Uh, I would put an emphasis um, on what actually happened when Saul obeys the gospel three days later. Uh, he was immersed in water for the forgiveness of his sins. Uh, in terms of our chart, I would put something about Saul being old enough to persecute the church. He was told not to delay uh, under the wind there. Baptism was commanded to wash away sins for the purpose. And I would also note he was not saved after three days of prayer and fasting, but he was saved in the act of baptism. Uh, it always em emphasizes, uh, it impresses me here 
uh, that Saul prays and fasts for three days. And in response, God sends a Christian to tell him what to do. And so I would ask, is it possible that somebody in the Madison area is praying and fasting right now, broken down in sin, asking God what they need to do? Is that possible? And is it possible that God might use us to answer that prayer? I would just suggest we need to be keeping our eyes open uh, for those opportunities. The next Saul might be my neighbor. The next Saul might be an SEA in one of our local schools that you're working with. The next Saul might be some guy that you meet on the bike trail. And um, so let's keep that in mind. God's not going to come talk to us and tell us to go meet <laughs> a guy traveling in a chariot along the road. Uh, but let's keep our eyes open for those opportunities because there could be somebody right now out there in the Madison area in the same situation that Saul was in, uh, praying and begging God to know what to do to be saved. And we might be the answer to that prayer. All right, so we come to Cornelius. And we don't have time to read the whole account uh, basically, Cornelius is a God-fearing Gentile. He is a Roman centurion. He prays to God, similar to what Saul was doing. Uh, Cornelius prays to God in response to his prayer. Again, God does not tell him directly what to do to be saved. But instead, an angel arranges for Peter to come and preach to him. Are we seeing a pattern there? God does not whisper to Cornelius, you need to be baptized. He doesn't do that. He uses somebody else. Uh, one of his people to do that. That's the honor that we have of preaching the gospel and speaking on the Lord's behalf in that sense. Uh, you may remember it takes some serious convincing on Peter's part. Peter doesn't want to do it. Peter has only preached to Jewish people up to this point. Uh, but Peter goes, he meets with Cornelius and his household, he preaches Jesus to this group. I'm just summarizing the whole chapter here, all of chapter 10. But this brings us to Acts 10, 44 through 48. Acts 10, 44 through 48. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. Last week I mentioned that the first part of this is one of uh, only two examples of Holy Spirit baptism where the Spirit falls on people and gives them the miraculous ability to speak in other languages. In Acts chapter 11, as Peter goes back to Jerusalem, he has to defend baptizing these people. They are Gentiles, and most people would have thought, you really shouldn't have done that. The gospel is for Jews only. And so he has to defend himself here. This is a change in God's plan. Not, not a change in God's plan. I guess God is announcing uh, this change in the way that the gospel is to be preached. And this is the way he defends himself in the next chapter. This is Acts 11. 15 through 18. He's telling them why he baptized these people. Acts 11, 15 through 18. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Notice, Peter compares what the Spirit does to Cornelius to what the Spirit did to the apostles at the beginning. And so as I understand this, this first part is not a matter of them being saved, but this was a sign for Peter to continue preaching. This was a sign that it was okay to be preaching to the Gentiles for the very first time. In fact, Peter specifically remembers Jesus referring to being baptized with the Holy Spirit as opposed to being baptized in water. 
with John's baptism. And now Peter sees that this is what Jesus was talking about. And so this then clears the way for Peter to keep on preaching. And when he does, you'll notice there in Acts chapter 10 that he commands Cornelius and his household to be baptized in water. He orders them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So, as we go back to our chart as to the age, how old is Cornelius? He is a Roman centurion. He's not a week or two old. This centurion is obviously a grown man. Uh, by the way, those in his household are also baptized at the same time. Some have latched onto this and have claimed, well, right here, this means babies can be baptized as well. However, it is really up to them to prove that there were babies in this man's house. It's not up to us to prove that there weren't. It's up to them to prove there were. Um, how old do you need to be to, a, to attain the rank of centurion in the Roman Empire, in the Roman military? I am guessing that you don't become a centurion right when you first enlist in the Roman army. This man probably is therefore a man of some experience. We might compare it to somebody my age being baptized. If I'm baptized along with my household right now, my point is, there are no babies involved. If everybody in my household is baptized at this moment today, there are no babies involved. And so my point is, if somebody tries to gamble their eternal salvation on the possibility that Cornelius might have had a baby at home, that is really not a solid argument. In fact, the evidence would point away from that, especially when we consider all of these other passages and the age that people were when they were baptized and the purpose of it and so on. As to the action, we don't have anything here. As to the when, we really have no indication of any delay. Uh, as to the purpose, baptism comes in the form of a command. So it's not explicitly stated, but it does seem pretty important, doesn't it? Peter had every right to command this man to be baptized. And um, so I find it interesting here. We have a preacher, Peter, an apostle, commanding a Roman centurion. I'm thinking the centurion's probably the guy accustomed to giving the commands. But here the preacher comes in and says, you need to be baptized and do it now or whatever. And this man obeys. This man accustomed to uh, giving orders is now obeying an order. Under other, I would point out that Peter tells them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you remember from last week, Jesus said to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so if somebody thinks that this is a formula of some kind, we have a problem. If somebody says, you must say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the baptism to be valid, we kind of need to ask, well, which one of these do we use? Is it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Or is it in the name of Jesus as was done with Cornelius? So that's, that's the issue here. So I would back up a little bit as we did earlier and emphasize this is not a magic phrase that needs to be spoken over the person being baptized, but this is the principle that baptism is done by God's authority in his name at his request according to the scripture. So looking back at our chart, the man's old enough to be a centurion. There's no delay as to the when. Baptism is commanded. It's in the response to a command, and it was done in the name of Jesus. And then we also see a distinction between Holy Spirit baptism, which seems to have shocked Peter. Wow, God did this to these people. Therefore, I can command him to be baptized with water baptism, kind of opening the door. Remember, Peter was given the keys to the kingdom. In Acts 2, he unlocks the, uh, the kingdom for the Jews. And in Acts 10, he unlocks the kingdom to the Gentiles. That may be one way that we could look at that. Um, and so he commands them to be baptized. And so there is a difference between the two, between Holy Spirit baptism and baptism in water. All right, let's move on to Acts chapter 16. On his second missionary journey, Paul crosses over into Europe for the first time, and he makes his way to the city of Philippi, a Roman colony. So this is the next reference to baptism in Acts. And so this is Acts 16, verses 13 through 15. Acts 16, 13 through 15. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled, a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. 
And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So a woman by the name of Lydia is the first convert in Europe. That's significant. That's kind of cool. Uh, on our chart, how old is this woman? Um, I guess you're not supposed to ask a woman's age. I don't know if that's still a thing or not. Uh, but as with the others, we don't have a specific age given. doesn't say she's 43 or 59 or whatever. Uh, but do we have any clues as to how old this woman is? Well, she is a seller of purple fabrics. And she seems to be self-employed, as we would say today. She is a successful businesswoman. And so the point is, as far as our chart is concerned, she is not a baby. She is not a young child, but she is an adult with her own business. As to the action, we don't have anything here. As to the when, the timing of it, we find that she's baptized after hearing Paul preach. So there is the listening to the sermon, then there is the baptism. And although the word immediately isn't used, there certainly doesn't seem to be a delay here. This happens all at the same time. We have nothing concerning the purpose, but under other, I would point out that as with Cornelius, her household is baptized. And as I understand it, the word household could have included not just her physical family, uh, descendants, but uh, her servants and others as well would have been included in this word. Um, okay, so as to our chart, we note this. She's a seller of purple. She's baptized after hearing Paul preach. She, along with her household. Um, I also appreciate this that this woman seems quite persuasive. Paul was quite stubborn himself, wasn't he? <laughs> See, I mean, he... He had an attitude. He was a stubborn fellow, but he was outstubborned by this woman. That's kind of the way I laugh when I read this sometimes, as she insisted that Paul and his companions stay at her house. And you know, you've had that argument with people, like who pays for dinner at a restaurant? No, let me pay for it. No, I want to... Okay, well, this woman won that argument with Paul, and she prevailed upon us. Paul got dominated into staying and could not leave. She won the argument. We had to stay at this woman's house. All right, let's keep moving. This one also takes place at Philippi. Uh, right after Lydia is baptized, Paul cures a demon-possessed girl. He casts the demon out, and so her masters are irate that Paul had taken away their circus act. They were taking advantage of this young girl by using her as an oddity and they were you know selling tickets or whatever we would say today to see what this young woman was doing to make money and so paul cures her they no longer have this source of income and, and they throw the city into an uproar they are irate and they have paul and silas arrested and thrown in prison so we pick up with acts 16 22 through 34 acts 16 22 through 34 the crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. There are many ways we could study this, but let's go back to our blanks, starting with the age. How old is this man? Well, we find he's a jailer. He's in charge of the jail. They don't usually give that position to toddlers, do they? So he's a grown man. Um, 
probably older than most. I'm assuming, I'm guessing that to be in charge of a jail at a Roman colony, you probably have to have some experience. I've been into a lot of jails uh, through my work with the Lord's Church, visiting uh, our members, visiting uh, people who want to know more, people who just need somebody to talk to. And there are obviously many people who work in the jail, but the person in charge is usually older than those who aren't in charge. And this is probably the case here. You have to have some experience to be the, the head jailer. Uh, as to the action, we don't have anything here, but what about the timing? How long between the hearing and the being baptized? Notice in verse 33, he is baptized immediately. There is no delay whatsoever. He does this that very hour of the night, the Bible says. Um, this is sometime between midnight, when Paul and Silas are singing, and sunrise. All right, so it's sometime in there, but it's still referred to being night. He's baptized immediately, that very hour of the night. Uh, we don't have anything under purpose, uh, but what about it being essential to salvation? Is this man's baptism in any way connected to salvation based on the context? Well, we go back to verse 30. And this conversation starts with the jailer asking the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And in response to that question, Paul tells him to believe in Jesus. Paul tells them then who Jesus is, and the man is baptized immediately. So I believe, yes, we can safely say that what this man is told to do is tied to salvation. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here. Uh, under other, we might point out that rejoicing follows belief, repentance, and baptism. Now, I also don't want us to miss the repentance part of this. This is very clear in this passage. Uh, this man, who was probably the one who beat Paul and Silas, now takes it upon himself to try to make this right, doesn't he? He washes their wounds. Notice this comes between the preaching and the baptism. And so his repentance between preaching and baptism is tangible. Now, if I were Paul, I might have been tempted to say, no, this can wait. You know, don't wash my wounds. Let's get you baptized. You know, let's get you baptized real quick. But that's not what happens here. Repentance comes first. And that's also, by the way, what we find in Acts chapter 2. Peter commands them to be baptized. Then he continued with many words saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And then the 3,000 people were baptized. So all at the same time, but he had to tell them what repentance actually meant for them. And in this case, uh, it meant washing their wounds. So the man had a change of heart resulting in a change of action. And then at that point, he is ready to be baptized. So as to our blanks indicate he's old enough to be a jailer. He's baptized immediately. It's essential to salvation. Um, he rejoices, not at the beginning, but at the end of these steps. And then we have another example of a household being baptized is something we might note here as well. Uh, the next one also takes place on Paul's uh, second missionary journey. After a quick stop in Athens, he continues down to Corinth, which, which is a city like Madison. It is a city built on an isthmus. And due to it being something of a crossroads for shipping traffic, Corinth had a reputation for immorality. Not to cut on sailors, but when you've got thousands of sailors hundreds if not thousands of miles away from home with nothing to do while ships are loaded they tend to get in trouble so Corinth had a reputation and um, that's what's going on in Corinth to be Corinthian was to be immoral uh, but in the city of Corinth the gospel had quite a bit more success than it did in Athens the educational capital of the world the intellectuals were up there in Athens they kind of took a pass on the gospel uh, only a few believed there but in Corinth, this immoral city, we come to Acts 18.8, where Luke, the author of this account, says this, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. On a chart, what do we learn about this man's age? He is the leader of the synagogue. So Crispus is a mature, responsible man. Uh, the leader of the synagogue would manage the property, and was also responsible usually for scheduling uh, who did what in terms of leading in worship and teaching. Uh, the point is Crispus is an adult. We don't have any insight concerning the action here, sprinkling, pouring, or immersion, but as to the when, we do find that Crispus and many others were believing and being baptized when they heard. In other words, there's no indication of delay. When they heard, 
they were believing and being baptized. Uh, this also reinforces the order of things. Hearing, then believing, then being baptized. Those three things in that order. Uh, we don't have anything regarding the purpose. Under other, we might note that a religious leader is baptized. I'm kind of assuming, we like to assume the best of people till they prove otherwise, but I'm assuming as a religious leader that he is a moral, upright man. A lot of people today say, if you're a good person, you're okay with God. Um, so he's probably not seen as being a sinner. Uh, and yet even good people need to be saved. Even good people are lost if, they're, if they've sinned and have not yet obeyed the gospel. All of us sin, uh, even if we don't look like sinners, whatever that means. So in our blanks, we know Crispus is a religious leader who believes and is baptized along with many others as soon as they hear the good news. This seems like a good place for us to pause tonight. Uh, hopefully we can come back together next week to continue in and perhaps conclude our study on this worksheet. If you have any questions, anything that we need to be praying about, please get in touch. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Thank you for loving us as flawed as we are. Thank you for your patience and thank you for Jesus. Thank you for making forgiveness possible. Tonight we also ask for continued healing for those who are suffering with the virus. Bless those who are separated from their families. We know that there is great danger in getting disconnected from those we love. There's also great danger in getting separated from our Christian family physically and, and with the spiritual support that we usually receive from being together. We pray that all of us might be able to come back together sometime soon. And we pray that we as your people in the meantime might be willing to continue doing good and sharing. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen.